All right, everyone, good morning. Thank you so much for coming this Mother's Day weekend. So great to see everyone. Um, I'm gonna bring Marianne up, who's um, really put this together. Um, so I'd like to thank Marianne and Liz, where's Liz? Um, um, our Mended Little Hearts connection um, to get this going. So welcome everyone. Come on up, Marianne. All right, thank you all for coming today um, to the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Connection for Critical Information for Parents of CHD Warriors. Uh, we are Mended Little Hearts, and we empower families through support and education. Uh, we are a group of heart parents that um, many of us here have gone through our experiences at Children's, and we have 83 chapters nationally. We are the Washington, D.C. area chapter and support Children's National, Fairfax Inova, and um, a couple other to come soon. We are made out of volunteers and we deliver 5,000 bravery bags every year throughout the United States. We have online connections. Uh, we do parent matching, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for our social media. We have CHD Awareness Initiative Advocacy here in Washington, D.C., and we are part of many um, education communities. And this is Liz Blumenthal. Hi there. Thanks for coming. Um, so my role with Mended Little Hearts uh, D.C. is to try to set up some educational programs, such as this one. And I wanted to just go through a couple of uh, ideas we have for future ones. Have you all had an opportunity to look, fill out the survey? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, good. Um, so anyway, these are, the, these are the topics we're considering. And if you have additional topics, there was a space on the survey to add. Um, but we're looking at nutrition and feeding, social behavior, learning. Which way do I push this to make it go? No? Um, congenital heart disease and family, partner marriage relationships, accessing resources, and medical anxiety, post-traumatic medical stress. So we're hoping you guys will be interested in some of these topics or let us know which topics you are interested in so that we can create programming focused on your needs. Thanks. Oh, and now I'm introducing the CANDU team, or at least starting with Mary. <laughs> Dr. D'Onofrio, sorry. Okay, everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna get us going. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary D'Onofrio, one of the pediatric cardiologists here. Um, I am director of the fetal heart program, so I get to meet all the wonderful families we take care of um, before their babies are even born and be with them on the start of their journey um, with us. I'm also co-director of the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Outcome Program um, with Jackie Sands, who is in the front row. Um, and you may wonder how on earth do these two things tie together. These are my two passions. Uh, and this neurodevelopmental program and what we're gonna talk about today really is the joining of the, the two fields that I'm very interested in. So what do we know about neurodevelopment and congenital heart disease? Well, it is a big problem that we have to deal with. Um, finally, we have more adults with congenital heart disease than children, so we now can look beyond just survivorship and look more towards quality of life and good outcomes for our patients in the long term. And so then this brings in neurodevelopment. So we do know that there's a problem. We've acknowledged that. Um, and this graph comes from an adapted um, uh, slide that Dr. Wernowski put together way back in 2006, but it definitely applies. It was published in 2012 uh, in the circulation guidelines. And what this shows, the x-axis is the um, degrees of congenital heart disease, the y-axis is pre uh, prevalence of neurodevelopmental impairment, and the grays represent 
uh, level of neurodevelopmental impairment that affects the ability to learn and succeed in school. And you can see even those kids with mild disease, about 20% uh, of them have some issues with learning. And as you head up the ladder of severity, more than half of the kids with severe congenital heart disease have issues with learning. If you're a palliated neonate, what that means is anytime we can't totally fix it, so all of our single ventricle patients on TANS are considered palliated neonates, about 70% of them will have some form of neurodevelopmental impairment. And if you add a syndrome, a chromosome problem, or something else, then almost all of those kids will have some issues with learning. So for those of us who care, it is a daunting task to take this on because our goal is to fix this because we want every kid not to just survive, but to survive well. Um, and so when we look at this, we look at a timeline of injury that starts in utero and then continues on through a kid's life into school and into adulthood. So we start out with their genetic factors that influence brain development. There can be compromise in utero. There can be compromise in the delivery room with kids with congenital heart disease. And then there can be uh, compromise any step along the way. So in the pre- or post-operative period, during surgery, especially if we need to use circulatory arrest. And many of our kids are left with leftover problems like blueness or cyanosis, cardiac dysfunction, or arrhythmias. So again, I'm the head of fetal cardiology, so where my interest mostly lies is here in utero, what can we do to correct the flow disturbances that occur? And then maybe what can we do in the delivery room to help our babies transition to postnatal life? So how do we look at the fetus? Um, we use ultrasound. Ultrasound is the mainstay now in obstetricians' offices. They take beautiful pictures of the face and the baby, and they're so cute to see. Um, but we can see the heart with really exquisite detail I'm going to get the movie to play here. This is a 20-week fetus. Um, four chambers easily seen, one, two, three, four. You can see the ventricles pumping away, uh, and the valves are working. And what's really cool to me is that this is a heart that's just the size of a quarter. So we're looking at 20 weeks gestation, and the technology allows us to see the details really exquisitely. So we can make then the diagnosis of congenital heart disease very clearly. So this is a fetus with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. You can see the left side of the heart just isn't developed. It should look like this. Instead, it looks like this. Um, but also what we can use is color imaging, and the color is the blood flow. And what I can see in this picture, this is again a fetus with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, is that this artery here, which is the aorta, that's the all-important body artery that sends blood to the brain, is very small. This blue one here is the size it should be, but instead it's the thread of a blood vessel with the red being backwards flow in that blood vessel. So you can imagine that may affect the way blood flow gets to the brain. We can also use ultrasound to look at blood flow in the brain, and this is the top of the head. There's a network of blood vessels that run through the brain. And then these kind of flow patterns, which are called Doppler, give us an idea of how blood flow moves through the brain. And what we know is the flow patterns here suggest that there's not enough oxygen and nutrients getting to the brain because the blood vessels are dilated. Now, as technology gets even better, this is fetal MRI. MRI is safe. Um, it's a giant magnet, it's not radiation, so we can use it in pregnancies and see the details very clearly of the fetus. You can see the face here very clearly, the limbs, um, the heart as it's coming around, um, the blood flow. And again, we can concentrate on that very complicated brain and see the details of the brain in utero, 20 weeks gestation, so halfway through the pregnancy. Here at Children's, um, we have an advanced brain imaging lab um, that's under the direction of Dr. Limperopoulos, who is an international leader in the field. Um, and using very specialized techniques, we can harness the power of MRI to look at details, including calculating brain volume, so size of each part of the brain, um, what's called gyrification, which is how the brain folds, and this is what changes through the pregnancy. You can see how complicated it gets towards the end. And then we can look at certain chemicals in the brain that really determine uh, how well the brain is developing. And so what this work has shown us 
um, is that there are delays in brain development in the third trimester in fetuses with con certain congenital heart defects. So we can start to see that brain development starting to lag behind, particularly late in gestation. And then how that correlates with newborn studies is looking at the brain before kids go to surgery um, is that there are delays in brain development that can be identified in certain heart defects up to being one month behind, about five weeks. So what that means is you have a full-term baby with congenital heart disease, they have a brain of a 35-weeker. Uh, and these delays are associated with both pre- and post-operative injury that we see um, that happens as a result of what we need to do to fix the heart. So what can we do about this? So as we go after modifiable factors, the first thing is prenatal diagnosis. So just by making the diagnosis before kids are born, what this one study showed was that brain injury was less by about half. So doing the right thing in the delivery room to help that kid transition to postnatal life makes a huge difference, minimizing brain injury that occurs right at the start. Uh, and what is really interesting is that benefit seems to continue even after surgery. This is a trajectory of brain development, and the red is those prenatally diagnosed. So again, intervening with just a few changes in the delivery room can make a difference. The other thing that's uh, really a hot topic is maternal stress. It's very obvious that ladies who are diagnosed with con uh, babies with congenital heart disease are going to be stressed out. Um, that's a given, and this is work from our group that shows, yes, they're stressed out. I was actually surprised it's not higher than this. Um, about half of the ladies reported significant stress who had babies with two ventricle heart disease and up to uh, three-quarters of those who had babies who had single ventricle heart disease. But what was interesting was looking at fetal brain MRIs is that maternal stress was in fact associated with a smaller hippocampus, which is a part of the brain in uh, fetuses with certain heart defects. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's important for memory, for emotions, and for motivation. So this to me says something that maybe we can target to make better. Can we relieve stress during the pregnancy? And it may have long-standing benefits for the baby. What about fetal intervention? Um, these are techniques that are done at only um, a certain amount of centers across the country. One intervention uh, is to change the flow in utero in fetuses who have a disease called aortic stenosis. So one of the arteries, the aortic valve, is, uh, is blocked, uh, and if the thought is that if you can open that valve in the fetus, maybe you can change the way the blood's flowing. And, and sort of change the congenital heart defect from um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome to a milder form of the disease. Um, another thing that people have thought about is, well, maybe that would change the way blood flows to the brain. And so in the early work by the group in Boston, they looked at blood flow to the brain before the procedure and found it was abnormal. Um, but then, uh, unfortunately, in the first study, after the intervention to open up the aortic valve, they did not um, find any changes in the blood flow to the brain. Um, so at least the early work suggests that it's more complicated than that, but this is something that's ongoing. This was published in 2010, and certainly nobody's given up on this as a potential modifiable factor. Oops. And then lastly, how about oxygen? We think that part of the problem might be that not enough oxygen is getting to the brain in certain fetuses with congenital heart disease. Um, what um, many have shown, including our group, is that if you give a pregnant mom oxygen in the third trimester, you actually can change the way blood flow moves through the fetus. Uh, and in this study, fetuses with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, again, had abnormalities in blood flow to the brain uh, at baseline. And then when giving the mom's oxygen, just for 10 minutes, it changed the blood flow uh, to the brain and made it more normal. What this graph shows, however, is that change only occurred if the oxygen was given in the third trimester. But still something to think about uh, as we move forward to try to correct um, the, the physiology problem and hopefully improve brain development. 
So this is all well and good for the babies to come. Um, but what about me? What about those kids who are already with us, who are growing up and going through school? Uh, and this is where the neurodevelopmental program comes in. This is the uh, paper that came out um, from the American Heart Association, which really finally um, made a statement that this is very important, and it came out in 2012. And what it says is that somebody needs to take responsibility for these kids, um, and it should be the cardiologist. So the cardiologist should be the home for any neurodevelopmental assessment program. Well, Jackie and I knew that from long before this paper came out, and um, we instituted our program certainly before this AHA statement paper. Um, but what it's enabled us to do is really have a resource to go to, particularly as we try to advocate for our families. So what does the paper say? Well, it says that mostly all newborns with significant congenital heart disease are at risk. This includes any baby requiring open heart surgery in the first year of their life, any kid with cyanotic heart disease, that means blue, any child with congenital heart disease and any other risk factor being born premature, that's 37 weeks or less, developmental delay or a genetic problem, if they need ECMO, heart transplant, CPR, or in the hospital for a long time, or if they have congenital heart disease and any other brain problem like a seizure um, or a finding on MRI. The guidelines suggest not just looking once, but looking through the continuum, and you're going to hear a lot more about this from my colleagues, but it's not good enough just to make one assessment. You need to look as infants through toddlerhood uh, and in through to adolescence and adulthood. So this is our program, um, the CAN-DO program, Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Outcome. Our goal is to maximize each child's potential for a bright future. So we're not looking for trouble. We're looking for things that we can do to help kids be the best they can be. That's what the program's all about. This is the roadmap, which you will see more in detail from my colleagues, but basically we start right when kids are born, and I'm going to say we start before kids are born. Um, as I meet families prenatally, we talk a lot about relieving stress and what we can do to prepare for, um, families for children um, with congenital heart disease. But then our team starts the process right in the intensive care unit with rounds, developmental rounds involving developmentalists as well as neurologists and then transition to a home program where we follow kids really through their lifetime. We give each kid an individualized developmental plan um, and what you can do at home. And these are simple things for the infant, avoid too much screen time, hold and cuddle your baby, um, talk to your baby as much as possible, position objects for reaching. And again, you're gonna hear more about this from my colleagues. Um, and around the first birthday, um, reading, upright seating, playtime with simple toys, introducing one toy at a time to sort of prevent against overstimulation, uh, and language is very important. Whoops. And then um, toddlerhood, um, self-regulatory routines. Um, you'll hear from Dr. Mintz that this is very important. Language is key, and again, playtime. So choosing um, what you're going to do during playtime to really help with development. And again, we added this because really um, parent mental health is very important in this whole process. So just to take care of yourself. And obviously the tips on exercise, good diet, get plenty of sleep, um, also very important um, for not only you but for your child. So with that, I'm going to end. Um, so in summary, what science is telling us is that uh, alterations in blood flow to the brain actually starts in utero uh, and are associated with um, identifiable delays in brain development um, that certainly impacts outcome later. And the modifiable factors that we're going after include, first off, planning deliveries as late in gestation as possible. So we want this brain to be as mature as possible, to really plan delivery room um, management to minimize any hemodynamic problems. We want to treat stress in moms and in dads. Um, and then we continue to work on treatment strategies to improve blood flow to the brain um, to really promote brain development starting in utero. So with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you um, very much. And next up 
is Dr. Mike Mint, who's going to talk to us about toddlers. Infants and toddlers. Infants and toddlers, sorry. Hi, thanks for having me today. Um, so, as uh, Dr. D'Onofrio mentioned, uh, in our clinic we see the infants and the toddlers. Um, and so we, um, well, let's go through the slides. We, we touch base with families while they're still here as inpatients, and we make plans to see them for follow-up during infancy and during toddlerhood. Um, so a few things we're going to talk about today. So common challenges for CHD kids in early childhood, things that we often see in our clinic among infants and toddlers. Um, focusing especially on executive functioning. It's kind of a buzz phrase that you might hear if you're, um, if you're uh, working with early intervention or other programs and preschool programs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what executive functioning really means and what it looks like in infancy and toddlerhood. And then we're going to talk about kind of some standard treatment recommendations and suggestions, some of which Dr. D'Onofrio kind of stole already, um, but we'll go into it with a little more detail. Um, so the Child Development Clinic is the birth to three clinic here in the hospital. Um, we are all psychologists, some are developmental psychologists, some are clinical psychologists, um, but all we do is birth to three and all we do is development. Um, and we participate in the can-do program, so we see kids from ages birth to three. As I mentioned, we try to touch base with families and uh, get some face-to-face -face contact while people are still here in the CICU or the HKU. Um, and then we usually see kids around, as you saw in the chart, around six to nine months of age, sometimes even a little bit younger. Um, we try not to go much younger than four months because at four months you start to see a really nice reach from a baby, you start to see them rolling over and doing stuff on their belly, getting up and prone. Um, and then we see them again as toddlers and then up until preschool age. Um, so we do a comprehensive developmental evaluation. The Bailey Scales of Infant Toddler Development is our primary tool. We do that, uh, use that measure on all uh, infants and toddlers and preschool age kids that we see in our clinic. And then we have other tools that we use as necessary, adaptive scales, behavior scales. Um, and I think not to be underestimated is the comprehensive developmental evaluation. And by that I mean our goal is not just to see how a child does in the testing room with us, what they do at the table on formal testing, um, but to really get a sense of what parents are concerned about. Um, what, uh, what, what the child is or is not doing at home in terms of home-based routines, sleeping, feeding, what their language is like at home. I can't tell you how many 15-monthers I've seen who have said absolutely nothing for me, but parents say that they have all these words that they use at home, and we certainly trust parents, to be honest. Um, but we have to because kids, as, as we all know, they look different in one place versus another. Um, so I think a really important way to think a good way to think about what our clinic does. We overlap with a lot of other services. I think a lot of you have been through um, infants and toddlers or the Parent Infant Education Program, also known as Early Intervention. Early Intervention is a federal program that exists everywhere in the country. Any child birth to three, um, parents can request to have an evaluation. And in most cases, if a kid is delayed or sometimes even just at risk for delays, they will provide services. And so what that often looks like is in infancy, and when I say infancy, I'm roughly talking about the first year of life. It will be physical therapy, working on how the kid is doing in terms of rolling over, getting up on their hands and knees, and then eventually walking. And then later, uh, toddlerhood, it tends to shift to speech therapy, occupational therapy. They also have something called special instruction, which tends to be an educator or special ed education specialist um, coming into the home. That program comes to the home and does an evaluation. A lot of what they do is similar to what we do. In fact, a lot of them use the Bailey. Um, their role is different. Their job is to assess does a kid technically qualify, and so they're really looking at the numbers. I'm sure a lot of them are great clinicians and do a good job asking about parents' concerns and getting a sense of what um, the child is doing, let's say, when they're not, when, uh, not necessarily during the evaluation, but in day-to-day -day life. Um, but because they are required by law to really look at the numbers and determine whether a kid qualifies or doesn't, they're a little bit bound by that. And we don't have that uh, burden on us. So what we do in our clinic is really kind of look at the big picture, right? We're trying to take a more comprehensive or holistic view of how a child is doing. Um, and so our first question whenever a parent comes into our clinic is, what are your concerns? Um, I think that uh, we hear lots of different concerns from parents. The most common ones we hear during infancy uh, refer to gross motor development, right? If a child is six months old and not rolling over, parents would say, well, you know, I saw in the chart that they're supposed to be rolling over and they're not. Um, or if the child 
10 months old and not quite crawling, they say, well, we're kind of waiting for him to crawl. Um, gross motor development is very important. It is certainly the thing that pediatricians um, will, will use as sort of the, the primary assessment of whether a kid is or is not meeting milestones. But um, gross, motor, gross motor is just one domain, right? And it is the most visible delay. By that I mean if a child is, let's say, 12 months old and is not crawling, that is the thing that will be most apparent to parents and even maybe friends of parents and certainly a pediatrician and will um, spark a referral to our clinic if it's a child who's not already sent here, as most of your kids hopefully will be. Um, and so um, parents, just like with the infants, it tends to be motor development that, uh, that gets parents concerned or tends to be at the top of their list of concerns with older kids, and by that I mean maybe 15, 18 months and up, certainly two-year-olds, parents are concerned about, um, about talking. And so our goal in our clinic is to assess these things. Yes, we're going to assess motor development if there's a 12-monther who is not crawling. Um, but our main goal is to see how the child is doing in other domains. And so with the example of the 12-monther who's not crawling yet, our goal is to see how is the child using his or her hands to solve problems? What are their play skills like? Um, looking out not so much whether they have words, because 12 monthers, some of them have a word or two, some of them have none, and that's okay. But what they're understanding in terms of language really kind of tells us what's going on in the brain. Um, we're also looking at things like social development, how engaged a kid is, how related, how interested in people versus interested in objects. Um, social communication skills is a big one for us too. So not whether they have words, but whether they're using their eyes and their hands and their facial expressions to gesture to communicate. So, um, so in that example, it, in the same vein as the 12-monther who doesn't crawl, when we get a 24-monther with no language, we're sort of doing the same, we have the same thought in mind. Yes, we're going to assess his or her expressive language, but we're going to be looking at receptive language, social communication skills, um, and, and what their social kind of interests and relatedness is in general. Um, so we talked about some of these different domains. I put quotes around cognitive because I don't think it's a term that really, um, it kind of refers to everything, right? Language is a cognitive skill. More often with uh, kids in our clinic, we talk about it as nonverbal problem solving skills or with the babies, we talk about it as play skills. So with a 12 monther, if they're not crawling, but they're using their hands in play like a 12 monther and they're engaging socially and understanding language like a 12 monther, then we're a lot less concerned um, than we would be otherwise. Um, so we're looking at uh, language skills, receptive language, expressive language, social communication we talked a little bit about. Um, we're looking at gross motor and fine motor. We're looking at um, uh, executive functioning, back to kind of the term we talked about earlier. Um, so executive functioning, oops, I'm back up there, let's see. Um, adaptive functioning refers to kind of home-based home -based routines. We also hear the term um, activities of daily living. So things like feeding, sleeping, as kids get up until age two, up towards age three, we talk about dressing and toileting. And we talk a lot about social functioning, uh, the attachment to parent, the relationship with peers and siblings. Um, and we talk a lot about social emotional development. Um, executive functioning is, as I said, a term that, that we hear a lot. It refers to things like attention, uh, whether a kid can sustain attention to specific toys, for example, activity level, a child's uh, sort of um, whether they're super fidgety, whether they can stay seated at the table or they're kind of more motor driven and need to be moving around the room, impulsivity, whether they can have a thought without needing to act on it. Um, so executive functioning is uh, described as the mental process that enables us to plan, focus, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks successfully. The best metaphor I've heard for it is the air traffic controller of the brain. So its job is to filter out distractions, um, decide what is relevant and important right now, and be able to block out everything else, um, prioritize tasks, set and achieve goals, and as I said, control impulses, have a thought without needing to act on it. Um, Executive functioning can be broken down to, into a few different categories. We talk about working memory. Uh, it's the ability to take different pieces of information in your brain and manipulate them mentally. Um, we talk about mental flexibility, so being able to stop what you're doing, for example, and shift to another task. Um, 
and we talk about self-control, which is sort of, uh, as we talked about, Im impulse control, the ability to set priorities. So what does executive functioning look like in infants and toddlers? Um, we talked a little bit about sustained attention. So a 12 month or for example, I would expect to stay seated at the table and engage with me in play for at least probably 15, 20 minutes um, and, uh, and tolerate sort of the exchange of toys. I'm bringing a certain object out, we're playing with this toy and then switching. Um, impulse control. So the ability to kind of sit and watch what I'm doing as opposed to um, needing to just grab at what I've, do, what I've got in front of me. Um, frustration tolerance. So when a task is difficult, how does a kid respond? Do they keep sticking with it or are they sort of done with it and throwing it? And then we talk a lot about self-regulation. Self-regulation uh, we consider to be the foundation of executive functioning. Um, so what does self-regulation mean? Uh, it means emotional regulation, um, so the ability to recover when, when upset, for example. Um, when we talk about babies, how do they recover? They recover by being given the bottle or the breast, and that's totally normal. As kids get up towards their first birthday, they still rely on that, but they also are developing other modes of settling and soothing. Um, so a great example is sleep. How does a kid settle to sleep? A two month or falling asleep on the bottle, totally typical as we get up towards eight, nine months. A lot of kids are given the opportunity to settle to sleep in other ways. Um, it does not mean that that is the only way to settle a kid to sleep, but it's something that we talk a lot in our clinic about as, a, um, as opportunities for working on self-regulation skills, that sleep is an opportunity for that. So without needing the bottle or the breast, without needing to be rocked, um, what does a kid do when they wake up in the middle of the night? Every kid wakes up in the middle of the night. I wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and how do we fall back to sleep? Do we need to have a parent come in and provide us lots of physical support? Do we need just a little bit of physical support? Do we need maybe just that social and language support, a little pat on the back and time to go back to sleep? Um, those are all opportunities for working on self-regulation. Mealtime is also a great opportunity for it, being able to sit for meals versus um, versus being distracted by screens, versus um, kids, including mine, who wants to come to the table for a bite and then go do something and then come back. Um, being able to sustain interest and attention in a, at mealtime. Um, Self-regulation, oops, which way did I go? I think I went way too far. All right, self-regulation forms the foundation of what will become executive functioning. So when Dr. Sanz is talking about concerns about potential ADHD, for example, those are things that we actually see in preschool age, toddler, and even in infancy. Um, we see those challenges as they pertain to self-regulation, and so we don't really talk about ADHD in my clinic. We talk about difficulties with executive functioning, and even before that, we talk about difficulties with self-regulation. So self-regulatory skills as cultivated in infancy and toddlerhood develop into executive functioning skills in early childhood and then on into um, adolescence. Um, attention and self-regulation, what will become executive functioning, is so important because it is a foundation of learning. By that I mean when we think about the kids who struggle when they get to kindergarten and they have to sit for circle time and they have to listen to what the teacher is saying, pay attention and follow along with what's going on in the class, um, that skill is is something that uh, if it's if it's not there, it can set off kind of a whole a whole mess of other problems, right? Um, and so, even if a kid is has language delays, if they're able to sit and follow along with the social routine of a classroom and follow along uh, with what a teacher is saying and doing, that's giving them a leg up. Um, social development is so important for the reasons I just kind of spoke about. Uh, Self-regulation and social skills develop hand in hand. Uh, we can think about that in terms of infancy, right? So uh, the nine-monther who every time they fuss or every time they go, uh, settle to sleep need to be fully rocked and uh, nursed or bottle fed to sleep, um, they are not being given the opportunity to develop more mature forms of, of uh, self-regulating. Um, by that I mean coming to rely on the social and emotional support, the love of a parent, the language of a parent, the smile of a parent. And so that skill of being able to go into a, 
a crying child's room in the middle of the night and just tell them it's okay, we're here, and then responding to that social and emotional connection is uh, not only built on self-regulatory skills, but it cycles back. It cycles back. By that I mean um, a kid with strong social skills is more likely to um, to respond to our um, our more mature forms of, of self. Uh, regulatory support. Um, so as I discussed, soothing in early infancy is oral, it is very tactile, it is very physical, and as we get towards later infancy, it transitions to more um, social forms of soothing like language and um, relying on that social connection with uh, and attachment with parents. So when we're making recommendations and suggestions to family, we are always starting with the parents, we're starting with what their concerns are, right? Um, I think many parents who come in, uh, especially when we're talking about more severe cardiac uh, defects, they're just, they're just happy to be there. They're happy that their kid is out of the hospital. We're seeing kids for, as outpatients and parents are just thrilled that their child is thriving medically and so are we. And honestly, um, the amount of time that we have spent recently on the CICU and the HKU has really helped us get a better understanding of what these children go through, especially in their first year of life. And so when we're seeing them for outpatients, I think Mary kind of alluded to this. We're not trying, I think you said cause trouble. We're not trying to cause trouble. We're not trying to be nitpicky. And so we're, we are taking a strengths-based based approach, right? If I see a child who is struggling in some domains but thriving in others, it's very important that we convey how amazing it is that that your children are doing so well in these domains. And yes, we're gonna talk about the challenges too, but um, I think we saw a child yesterday who had an extremely complex medical history. Um, she was just over two. And yes, she had some challenges, but it was remarkable given what she had been through medically um, and what her first year of life looked like that she was thriving. And so we try our best to really focus on that. I hope that as parents, you all feel like we do focus on the strengths and then also talk about the challenges. Um, I think parents often talk a lot about catching up. I've hear, heard things, and I'm not sure where people hear these things, but well, a former preemie, for example, by their third birthday, they should have caught up, right? The reality is um, that, that that isn't really the goal, right? Um, our goal when we see kids, and we see kids in my clinic every six months. So if I see a kid at 12 months and he's functioning at the nine or 10 month level, and then I see him six months later and he's functioning at the 15 or 16 month level, that's six months worth of progress in six months time. Maybe the parent is gonna say, oh, I was really hoping he had caught up. He's doing great, he made six months worth of progress. I don't make six months, more than six months worth of progress in six months time in terms of my learning, right? We can't expect a kid to do that either. So our goal is that a kid keeps making progress. And over time, I think the reason people say that about three-year-olds, that a preemie is supposed to look like a three-year-old at three years old is because at three years old, it's really hard to see the difference between a three and a half year old and a three year old, right? What does a three and a half year old do language wise that a three year old doesn't? A lot if you look really precisely and specifically, but if you hang out with him at a party, you're not gonna notice the difference, right? And so I hope parents don't feel disappointed when they come and, and say they're three, we say they're three and a half year old functioning like a three year old. Um, I think what that means is that uh, that if there is a delay, the delay is less visible and um, probably less impacting their development at that time. But but that that's okay, right? Uh, we I think it's unfair to put that expectation on our kids. Um, we try to focus a lot on quality of life, so focusing on um, joy and love in the parent and child relationship, making sure that parents are not being burdened by treatment. Um, we see kids, especially in the more affluent counties where they've got three or four different therapists coming from early intervention and they, they're also supplementing with two private speech therapies a week and they're also doing this toddler group and of course they're doing um, Gymboree and six other things like swimming classes. And some of those things are wonderful. And what I say to the family is, if this is what you want to do, if you are, if you are experiencing joy through these things, um, then great, but I think there is a um, there's a social pressure, especially in certain communities, to enroll your kids in these things. So I'll try to break it off between two things. One is the therapies and one is the activities. Um, if your kid does not go to Jim Bree, they are not missing out, okay? <laughs> um, 
Gymboree is a wild experience, tons of fun. Birthday parties at these places are great. Um, but I don't think that those are opportunities for really learning social skills, right? It's very different from a one-on-one -on -one experience like a play date. It's very different from engaging with a parent in simple play. Um, and uh, I think, I don't think any parent should feel like they have to do those things. Similarly with therapy, there is, um, I talk about the law of diminishing returns, right? Getting therapy once or twice a week is wonderful. As you add more and more therapy, especially if we're talking about private therapy outside of the home and the family has to load their kids into a car, drive for half an hour, sit in the waiting room with their other kid while their, while their CHD kid is getting half an hour of speech therapy, load back in the car, get home, and, they don't, and, and it's cutting into their time with their child. If that's how they're spending two hours on a Wednesday afternoon, sitting through rush hour traffic, versus getting two hours at home where they're sitting with the kid and engaging and reading and playing. Which do you think is really going to support the child's development, especially if we're talking about social development and the connection with parents? And so I really try to talk parents through the law of diminishing returns. Uh, more and more, more therapy does not necessarily mean better. Um, and with my kids, and by that I mean birth to three, um, therapy is a, ch is a parent guidance experience, right? And those of you who have been through early intervention, I think sometimes parents are frustrated. They say, oh, barely even, the, the therapist barely even plays with my kid. They're mostly talking to me. That's because that's their role. Their role is to give you ideas for things to work on. What a child does in 45 minutes with a speech therapist is not going to impact their development as much as what a parent is doing with them all, all, you know, all day long, five, uh, seven days a week. Um, so, uh, as we discussed, early intervention, infants and toddlers is how it's known in most counties, but also called parent-infant education. Uh, we talked about physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, special instruction as a special educator. Um, in my experience with these, the right type of therapist, and perhaps more importantly, the right therapist in terms of the connection with the kid and or the connection with the parents is far more important than which domain or discipline they come from, and it's far more important than the quantity of therapy. Um, as kids get up towards age three, or in some counties age two, they transition to a preschool-based um, setting to get services, often called child fine. Um, I think this is a hard thing for a lot of parents, especially parents of medically complex kids. Um, I think for any parent sending a kid to school, whether it's at age five for kindergarten or at age three for preschool, it's a difficult thing. Um, I think it's also hard because a lot of these kids get free pu public transport and so we're putting them on the bus, um, which is hard to, for a lot of parents to wrap their heads around putting their three-year-old on the bus and staying by for five hours. Um, there are some benefits to the preschool classroom and I'm happy to talk with anyone one more about it. Uh, generally speaking, it's, um, it's more time and more hours. I know I said more is not necessarily better, but um, but there are benefits to being around other kids. I think one of the biggest challenges with special education preschools is the goal of inclusion versus more intensive. The more intensive classroom, um, the more attention they get from a teacher, direct attention. The, um, so there are classrooms that have like a two to one ratio or three to one uh, student to teacher ratio. The kids in those classes tend to be a little more impacted, maybe less verbal or even nonverbal, versus an inclusion classroom with maybe 10 kids, two teachers, where the kids are more, um, tend to be higher functioning. And so there's always the kind of trying to strike the balance for each kid, making sure that they're getting enough attention, but they're also being exposed to kids that are at their level. I think no one wants their kid to be the highest functioning or the lowest functioning kid in, in the kid's class. Um, and uh, so what we really focus on in our clinic are things that I think parents tend to focus on less. Like I said earlier, parents are focused on when's my kid gonna walk, when's my kid gonna talk. We're focusing not on when's the kid going to talk, but what are they understanding, especially for kids with some motor difficulties, right? Um, they might have trouble forming sounds. They might have trouble talking. But if they're understanding things at our age level, that's giving us a real sense of what's, of what's going on in there. Um, we talk a lot about social communication skills, especially in, uh, for kids who are just kind of around that first birthday up through the second year of life, making sure that they're using their eyes and their face and their hands to communicate. Uh, we talk a lot about play skills, making sure that um, kids are making the transition from more sensory-based for forms of play, which, you know, what it was a six-month or do, they bang blocks. But a nine-monther starts to think about how things go together. Container play, a block goes in a cup. It's the first thing that kids do that they really get the two things go together. So we talk about functional play. 
um, and then working up towards things like pretend play. Um, and all of these things, to some degree, target that self-regulation skill, right? Play is about sitting and focusing and sustaining attention with objects. Receptive language is about listening to what's going on in the world around you, paying attention. Um, so we talk a lot about the home-based routines. We talked about this earlier in terms of sleeping and feeding and how those things affect self-regulation. Um, Playtime, I just kind of talked about that. Soothing, we talked about. Um, sensory modes of soothing. One thing I didn't really talk about, screen time, which is kind of amazing that I've spoken for 20 minutes and haven't talked about screen time. <laughs> um, so uh, screen time is bad. Everyone knows that, right? Okay. <laughs> but it's not that simple. It's not that simple. And it's, you know, the screen is on in my house sometimes. I use it when I need to. I try not. I think the problem with screen time is that any problem that it solves, it creates a whole new set of problems. If you rely on screens to get your kids to leave you alone so you can cook dinner, what are they going to need the next night when it's time for you to cook dinner? Um, more importantly, from a neurological perspective, parents who say to me, screens are the only way I can get him to sit, I can get him to just sit. What does that mean? That means that the only way that we're getting his brain to calm down enough to sit, to turn off the motor functioning, is overstimulating it with lights and sounds and movement. And it's basically teaching the brain what a lot of us, I think, have started doing, which is the only way I can sit and take a break is get my phone out and checking my email. That's overstimulating our brains. Um, and so what we want the brain, what we want our kids to learn is that the way to calm down is to tone everything down, not turn everything up. Um, there was a handout out there called E Play Love that kind of has the, the dogma of our clinic as created by Dr. Penn and Glass, who founded the clinic. Um, we talked a lot of, about a lot of these ideas. If you have the handout, um, look it over, and if you have questions or thoughts about it, let me know and we can talk about it later. I think I'm over. We talked about the play dates versus the overstimulating group of thons like Jimbury. We talked a little bit about the sequence of play during infancy and uh, early childhood, and we talked about the most important thing, joy in the parent-child relationship. And on that note, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for having me, Dr. Sands. Okay. Hopefully I won't mess up the slides. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to talk about now what this looks like as kids get a little bit older and what kinds of things we're looking for as kids get older. So just so I get a sense. How many parents of like four to 10 year olds or so? Any like preteen and teen parents? <laughs> um, so this is gonna be, we focus a lot, on, I focus a lot on this four to 10 group and then as, as teenagers as well. Um, and so I see the kids in the clinic as they turn, you know, sometimes the older three and a half year olds that are pretty close to four and then four and older. Um, and as we heard, uh, congenital heart disease definitely changes the way that the brain develops, even in utero, and it leaves it more susceptible to injury. But it's really much more complicated than that. There's a whole range of factors that play into how a child's brain develops um, within this context. Um, so really we think about demographic and psychosocial factors that impact the child's development, including um, your access to services, um, you know, stress and anxiety in the family can impact the way the brain develops. Boys, unfortunately, are at higher risk when they're babies for a lot of things, so even gender or sex has a, has a big impact. We think about all the preoperative factors, things that are happening between birth and when the child gets their first surgery. Um, we think about everything that happens around the time of the operation, which is a lot of the risk factors that we think about in the, in the uh, research. And this has a little bit less research behind it, but we also think about current cardiac function, how a child's ongoing cardiac status can impact brain development, their level of oxygen saturation or um, intake. So what does this look like as kids get older? There's a range of possible outcomes. A lot of the literature talks about um, outcome as a singular. I like to talk about it as a plural. There's not one type of outcome that we're looking for. There's not one classic um, presentation of a child with congenital heart disease. It's a range of possible outcomes. What we've just heard about is that there are early speech, uh, motor, and feeding issues that some, you know, 
uh, parents might talk about it as catching up. It's not really catching up. It kind of grows into something else. But, you know, by the time a child is three or four, they're walking. Generally, they're talking. Um, many of them are. And so the risk is here that they get discharged from these early intervention services before the other issues may become apparent. Um, so we want to try and build a bridge for children there. Um, and so that's why I see this three to four time point is a very critical time point for the evaluation to make sure that if you're dropping out of those early intervention services, you've got something else to catch you as the child moves towards school age um, and we don't kind of forget about it. Um, as the child enters preschool, school age and older, and these can occur even in the absence of any early developmental delays, we focus on certain key areas of functioning. You're going to hear again a lot about attention and executive skills because this appears to be one of the more commonly reported areas of concern. Um, we think about visual spatial, visual motor, and fine motor skills. I like to think about this as where the motor skills development goes as a, as a child goes into school age, so how well they can control a crayon and then a pencil in order to do handwriting, tie shoelaces, button up their clothes, stuff like that. We think about higher order language. So now a child is talking about how are they using grammar and syntax, how are they using language to communicate, can they organize their language well. We think a lot about social skills and we think about academic skills development. None of these things exist in a bubble, so we don't think about these skills as operating independently. Obviously, something as complex as social skills or academic skills rely on many of these other skills, and um, early development cascades into later development. So there's more thought now about how early language development, early social skills development, early executive skills development moves forward into how you um, develop your higher order language, academic, and social skills. So all these things kind of play together. But our assessments look at these skills in particular detail. I'm going to talk a lot about executive functioning because it's one of the things that we worry about most. Um, as you've heard, it's a set of behaviors. It's sort of an umbrella term for a broader um, set of behaviors that are responsible for purposeful and goal-directed activity. It's um, used to organize and direct both your cognitive activity, but also your emotional responses to things and, and your overt behavior. So in other words, it's not the know-how, it's not your intellectual functioning, which for many kids with CHD is in the range of normal, but it's the how you do something. It's how you get from point A to point B. Um, most theoretical models, once you get to the school age group, think about three core areas of executive functioning. Um, inhibitory control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility that build into higher order skills like planning and organizing, problem solving, and really importantly, integrating or pulling information together into concepts. So in other words, you got to be able to put on the brakes um, and inhibit um, your behavior and control it. That's sort of what this self-regulation turns into, um, ignore and inhibit competing stimuli. Working memory is sort of like, I want you to think about it like um, your mental chalkboard. It's not your long-term storage. It's not the filing cabinet where you put stuff away, but it's where you're working with information in the moment. You're thinking about something. You either pull it out of storage or you listen to a teacher say something. You work with it, juggle it around on that chalkboard. You put it away back into storage or you erase it. Flexibility, a lot of people think of this, but it's really this. It's the ability to, like Michael mentioned, shift from idea to idea, shift from task to task, make transitions, but also to generate multiple solutions to a problem and, you know, think about different things at the same time. And these things really play together in, to go into planning and problem solving. What do kids with CHD look like at school age. We are still trying to figure this out. <laughs> like I mentioned, there is no one outcome. There's no one thing we're looking for. But we're realizing that there are certain diagnoses that occur within this population um, at a higher rate than in the general population. So we know that there's an increased incidence of diagnoses like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Um, if you look at different studies, the estimates vary, but it's up to 52% in the single ventricle patients. Take a breath, that means that half are normal. Um, and that in, in sort of the tetralogy and TGAs and other um, defects, it gets closer to like a third. Um, there's higher rates of access to remedial services, higher rates of grade retention or tutoring or access to special education services. Again, about 30 to 50%, depending on which study you look at. Um, because of this, we believe there's higher incidences of learning disability or learning disorders, although that specific question hasn't been probed yet. 
Um, so as a caveat, this may be an underestimate because we're also finding in many of our studies that those children who we find in our testing would qualify for special education services are not receiving them. So there may be more, you know, some will estimate 30%, but I suspect that more than 30% have some form of a, a learning disability. There's also higher rates of autism spectrum disorder. So compared to the general population, there's estimates that range from a two-fold increase to a four to five-fold increase. The methodology of those studies has a lot to do with it. The reality is probably somewhere in between, between two or three-fold increase of a diagnosis of autism. There's also higher rates of um, mood and anxiety disorders. Um, so what we really want to do with a program like ours is to improve the outcome. Some might recognize this from some social media campaigns. This is, I think his name is Josh Rossi, is the photographer. Um, and this is a young man with hypoplastic left heart. And he dressed up as Superman. Um, so we really want to um, help our heroes here. <coughs> our goal is to evaluate your child at key points in their development. And we think about this both um, in terms of growth spurts, so sort of neurodevelopmental stress points in terms of we're expecting them to make a leap developmentally with a particular skill at this stage, um, or with stressful transitions in the environment. So all of a sudden, they're going to be thrown into a situation where a lot more is expected of them, like the transition to kindergarten. Infants and toddlers change so quickly, and, and, and Michael alluded to this, that they're rapidly acquiring skills. A three-month-old, a six-month-old, a 12-month-old all look wildly different in terms of what they're expected to do. So we use more frequent monitoring at this stage. And as a child gets older, we like to spread things out and not overtax people in terms of coming in for evaluations. Um, but there are certain points where we really want to look at a child's um, development carefully. Um, one key point for me is definitely this four to five year old um, time point where we start to be able to differentiate in our evaluations the different skills and not just lump cognitive together, but look at executive, nonverbal, verbal, and, and kind of parse things out. And at that point also, you're really going through a big growth spurt in terms of your executive skills, particularly with self-regulation. Um, you're going through a big growth spurt with social skills, understanding your own perspective as separate from others and your language is getting a lot more complex. So if you think about a three-year-old, maybe young four-year-old versus a kindergartner or a five- or six-year-old, they're doing wildly different things in these areas. Um, and this maps onto what we expect them to do. Now we expect them to don't go into a classroom, follow a classroom routine, sit still for circle time for probably longer than a preschooler would, um, and to um, interact more independently with their peers, play cooperatively. Um, as you get closer to eight, you start um, expecting more in terms of their abstract thinking, concept formation or pulling information together, social skills and independent problem solving. Um, and then as they get towards this like wild 12-year-old phase, which is always really confusing, and then again in high school and young adulthood, you get huge growth spurts with respect to executive skills and complex thinking. You notice that executive skills is like at each of these time points because it is, it is um, a set of skills that relies on a very widespread brain na network. It involves basically everything in your brain, and it has the longest and most protracted course of development. So by some estimates, these brain networks are still developing into your late 20s. Um, and I like to joke that after that it goes downhill, which is sort of true as well, um, not shortly after. Um, but that's why we like to monitor that very, very closely, because you can look great in your early childhood, and then it starts to look a little bit mildly different as you get older. And a lot of the changes that we see in this area um, can be subtle. So you can have a kid who's struggling, and, and the school system may have some difficulty teasing apart why, um, and the answer may lie there. Um, stress points, so like I mentioned, kindergarten entry is a big one. They generally are expected to sit still uh, more than they are before, hopefully not too much. Um, hopefully it's appropriate sitting still expectations, I guess I should say. Um, they have to attend more for longer periods of time. They're expected to self-direct for short periods of time. And you have to have a lot of, a lot of more kind of independent self-care capabilities. You have to be able to use the bathroom, you know, get changed, eat independently, and employ some basic social problem solving with your peers. All of this with some support. Third grade. Um, it's a big transition point. It used to be fourth, and now everything's kind of moving easier <laughs> earlier. Um, like kindergarten is the new first grade, third grade is the new fourth grade. You shift from you're learning to read, you're learning to do math, and now you're shifting into reading comprehension. You're reading to learn something. You're looking at a textbook chapter. Um, you're writing to express to the teacher that you understand a concept. 
you're using calculations, but for a bigger kind of problem-solving task. In sixth grade, the demands go up again. You're now managing maybe multiple teachers, multiple projects at once. You go from doing worksheets to projects. High school, again, your workload increases. Demands on independence within that increase. And there's a lot of increased social demands. If we all think back to high school, we can remember that. Um, and again, in adulthood, now you really have to be independent. You've now got to manage your medical appointments independently. Remember to take your medicines, um, you know, manage your finances, all of that piece. Um, so we think about this not just what the skills look like at each point in development, but what you are expected to do. So at each stage where we work with kids, we think about how can we intervene to make this better. So again, sort of to echo what Michael said, we're, we, I don't want you to think that we're looking for problems. I mean, we kind of are, but we're also looking for strengths. Where you're doing really well, let's buffer that and keep you moving in the right direction by buffering any weaknesses that are there. So we think about what therapies might be appropriate, like speech, OT, PT, psychotherapy, executive skills, coaching, and tutoring could be options. But again, there's a lot, of, a lot of diminishing returns, and we want to make sure that your time is used well, so we try to prioritize. We think about accommodations and support. How can your child learn best? How can we put supports into their environment to buffer these weaknesses? So for some kids, if they have trouble independently going through multiple step tasks, how can the teacher help by breaking that down for you, setting intermediate deadlines, and working with you on that? We collaborate with schools and community resources. So we don't want to be driving around to therapies all the time. How can those therapies be integrated into a child's school day? Our goal here is really to change the story. So I came in 2010 and started working here with kids. And, and really, sort of, this is a story we would hear from parents as I was getting these guys you know, when they were 10 um, without any prior um, evaluation. We would hear, you know, there was an early speech delay, he maybe wasn't eating great, um, but we were told to call in early intervention and everyone was telling us, don't worry, don't worry, he's going to catch up. So then, you know, they got to pre-kindergarten and we noticed that he was having some trouble with those sound symbol relationships, like he couldn't get that well, and the teacher kept saying that he had trouble sitting still in circle time. Um, and then, you know, it turned out now that he's in third grade, his reading's really slow and clunky, and he doesn't always understand what he's read. He's having trouble keeping track of his work. But the pediatrician told us, you know, that he's been through so much, so just give him a little time and maybe he'll grow out of this. Um, and then now he's in middle school and he's getting C's, so I guess that's average, but why is this so hard for him and he's getting really upset about what's going on? So this is the trajectory that we want to change. I, I, you know, it's never too late to seek out help for these kinds of things, and we certainly do and can intervene here, but I don't want it to get to this point. So that's how we formed a program where you don't get your first evaluation at that stage. What we want now to do is change the message a little bit and change the way we think about this. So we want to hear, okay, go to early intervention, and then we'll come back and we'll continue to monitor how this is progressing. Okay, kindergarten is now going great, but he's still having trouble sitting still and with self-regulation. Okay, well, let's put some supports into place in the environment. We don't want the teacher to think that he's just a bad kid who doesn't want to sit still. We've got to explain why this is happening and teach her how to, you know, support. Maybe he sits in a bean bag and he sits right by the teacher who can prompt and redirect him. And let's start some therapies in place. Okay, so maybe the organization is hard and that entire order skills are a little bit tough. Okay, so let's add some executive skills coaching and maybe a little resource instruction in the school to tackle how you do reading comprehension, teach them some strategies for that. So that by the time you get to middle and high school, maybe reading is not his favorite thing to do, but he is getting A's and he's really proud of how he's progressing and how, you know, how it's going. And we're not seeing any kind of anxiety or issues around that. So that's really what we want to see and how we want to change it. So. Earlier is better. That said, it's never too late to evaluate or for problems or to intervene. Um, we can change these trajectories at any point in time. Um, and so I'm going to use executive function as a quick example of this, that there are interventions for this across the lifespan, and there's ways to intervene with this across the lifespan. Um, there's a variety of ways that interventions for executive skills have been studied. Some are computerized cognitive training, physical activity, School, different school curricula or school add-ons, and then different kinds of therapies that can be um, tailored to specific skills or even pushed into the community. What we know about improving executive skills is that those who most need it improve the most. This is what the research shows. If you are starting at a lower point, you show the most improvement. 
Um, unfortunately, those cognitive training programs that look really fancy schmancy, the transfer effects are narrow, meaning that um, you might improve on that one skill that they're training you up on, but that doesn't transfer to other skill areas automatically. You need to work on that separately. So if you do a working memory program, your working memory gets better, but your math doesn't. So we need to work on that a little bit. We know that we need to continually push the limits for executive skills training in order for it to work. It needs a lot of repeated practice, so same thing that Michael said, those 45 minutes of therapy a week, it's kind of like if you go to the gym for 45 minutes a week and that's all you do, probably not going to lose a lot of weight. But if you do it consistently through the week and build up your activity level throughout the week, that's going to work. So same kind of thing with cognitive training, repeated practice is key. Once you stop practicing, those benefits diminish. The reason for improvement might not be what you think, so a lot of people really latch onto this computerized training, but there's some suspicion that it's not the actual computer game that's helping you, but the coaching that goes along with it, because they all come with coaching, like someone that talks to you every week. An improvement depends on how an activity is done. So there's a lot of research on exercise, but if you, ju if you just do exercise, that doesn't improve your executive skills. It's really the other components associated with the exercise program, like having to go to the gym, like you have to build that into your day and organize your day around it. Or if you're playing a soccer game, there's strategy and strategic thinking involved in that. Those are the components that actually improve executive skills. And your outcome measures need to really also test the limits of executive skills to show what progress you're making. The other thing about interventions is that we can't think about just one skill because none of these things, as I mentioned, exist in a vacuum. Um, Adele Diamond has very elegantly pointed out that there certainly are direct roots of these interventions where whatever program you're doing will improve your executive skills, um, which then you know, reduces the risk of particular disorders or improves your academic outcomes. But there's, there are indirect roots of these interventions as well. So just participating in some therapeutic program builds your self-confidence, makes you feel better about how you're doing, increases your social belonging and support, because a lot of these are in group format improves your fitness or makes you happy. A lot of these things, especially when you, when you look at the interventions geared towards children, they're fun. And that also helps build executive skills and creates a lot of positive feedback loops here that helps improve the disorder. So we can't think narrowly about these. We have to think about things that are fun, that build kids' self-confidence. It's, it's not, we don't want to think about this like an adult that had a stroke and is going to the gym to do their PT, because that's really too dull for kids and that's not going to help them. It doesn't help the adults either. We want to think about these as something fun that they're going to want to engage in and motivate change. So one might also argue, I also have to always sneak pictures of my kids in here, that there are activities that we engage in every day with kids that could be either studied or harnessed as modes of intervention. So, yeah, I agree. You don't have to overschedule yourself. Don't go to, like, 18 million classes. But, you know, there are certain activities that are being looked at in terms of improvement of executive skills. Yoga, martial arts, and these kinds of things, those are certain physical activities that have been studied because you have to use mindfulness and improve your self-regulation. Music instruction, again, it's that planning and self-regulation. You have to multitask when you're doing music. Um, a lot of music instruction is group, and you have to build your social skills that way. Play is really, really important, both um, imitation and pretend play and collaborative play with other kids. My poor son always gets dressed as Elsa. Um, but, you know, that teaches those social skills and is a method for kids to kind of scaffold development. And that's why a lot of the most effective strategies for improving executive skills are these preschool curricula that build on play. They don't sit kids down and make them do puzzles in these curricula. They sit them down and say, what are you going to play? Who would you like to play with? And what are you going to do if this happens? It's, it's more in the context of play. What we need to figure out is we know that we can make this better, but we don't know um, how long those treatment effects last, what this does to academic outcomes or other domains. Um, there are lots of interventions out there that are diagnosis specific, like a di uh, there's intervention programs for autism or for ADHD or for this. But we want to think about going across diagnoses now and finding what the common elements are. We need to study um, how to make this more accessible. Not everyone has someone who does this intervention in their community. How can we push this into communities and train um, our schools and other resources to give these interventions? We want to know what we're doing. Are we improving the skills or are we normalizing them? And can we demonstrate that meaningful transfer and maintenance of gains? What, what will influence maintenance of gains? 
They also need to know the impact of motivations. And this is really important for teenagers and young adults. How, you know, they're not always too motivated to get involved in, in these interventions and how can we get the buy-in. So that's what I had to say. Um, and now I'll transfer on to Wanda Rankin, our education specialist. Hello, good morning. Hi, I'm Wanda Rankin. I'm the education specialist. I joined the team October, September, October 2017, so I'm a newbie. And today I'm going to provide an overview of education, educational options in school districts for you. All right, how many of you have heard of No Child Left Behind? I think everybody has heard of that. Well, as you can see, No Child Left Behind uh, was implemented in 2002, but in 2015, President Obama signed into law Every Student Succeeds Act. So e ESSA is now the new law or the act um, that we're currently looking at. It's a commitment to equal opportunity for all students and high academic standards to prepare students to succeed in college and career. And not only just in college and career, but also in community activities. Okay, that's okay. Two other laws I want to briefly look at are Section 504 and IDEA. So if we look at Section 504, that is a part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. It's a civil rights law and it protects the rights of individuals with disabilities and programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. So a student who has a disability which substantially limits one or more major life activities has an accommodation plan developed. That plan is developed by not just the school team, but the parent. The parent is an equal partner in this process. And some of those life activities include, major life activities include eating, breathing, walking, learning, concentrating, thinking, or caring for or of oneself. Now it won't move. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you click this just one? The, just the regular. Okay. The last Put that down. Okay. Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. In 1975, Congress and the President enacted. Public Law 94142. From there, we've gone and we've moved forward to IDEA. In 2004, IDEA was updated. It's really, uh, the name is Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. We look at providing supports for students in, uh, from birth to high school or age 21. Students cannot be denied an education if they have a disability. We must evaluate those students yearly or every three years or when appropriate. And schools must monitor students' responses to research-based or evidence-based interventions, specifically in regard to identifying specific learning disabilities. Okay. Not working again. Jackie, you want to look at us? Okay, we may have it. I know Dr. Mintz and Dr. Sands discussed early vention, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but it does provide services that focus on helping families learn ways to help their children learn and grow with everyday activities. And if children need additional support, they sit with the, um, the parents sit with the school team and they develop an IFSP. Okay. Let's look at school-age students, promoting school success. 
We also have child fine for students that are school age. So we're not just looking at those children who attend public school, we're also looking at those children who attend private school, parochial school, or home school. School districts must use a multi-tiered approach to identify students' needs early and then support students who have not just learning difficulties but behavioral difficulties or needs. Struggling students are provided with interventions at increasing levels of intensity to accelerate their rate of learning. Some school districts are using what we call response to intervention. Have any of you heard of that? It's RTI. So I didn't want to go from zero to 100 talking about 504 or IEPs. There should be supports in each school before a student is refer referred for a 504 plan or an IEP. So response to intervention is a research-based process developed to help struggling students at the earliest signs of need, both academically and behaviorally, while in the general education classroom. Now let's look at this pyramid. If you have a school that is a typical school, comprehensive elementary school, middle school, or high school, most of the students are at the tier one level, where 80% of the students are making progress with the general education curriculum. As we move up to tier two, we see that 15% of the students aren't really doing well with that general education curriculum and they need additional supports. So we'll, con we'll consider them as an at-risk group. So strategic interventions for those students are put into place and then supplemental supports with increased time and intensity. So these children may get support from a reading teacher, an itinerant teacher, a paraprofessional or other adults in the room other than the general education teacher. That can be a pull-out program or a push-in program when those persons go into the classroom and work as a team with the general education teacher. If we look at Tier 3, 5% of those students still may have some difficulty in the classroom. This is a more intensive individualized intervention. It's customized to meet those students' needs that are really, really high-risk students. Um, I know recently with budget constraints, some of the schools have not been able to provide one-on-one -on -one interventions, so the children may continue to get a different type of intervention in a small group of two or three students, depending on the jurisdiction. Now, let's just say that we have a student who has gone through Tier 1, Tier 2 and Tier 3, and they're still not doing well in school, that child may be referred to the school team to see if they may need um, an evaluation to determine if they need 504 or IEP support. All right, some of the benefits of RTI. We focus on data better um, to address the student's needs. We eliminate the wait to fail model. So we don't wait till the child is doing poorly. We conduct progress monitoring for all the students to make sure all students are meeting success. It reduces the dropout rate, transition from remedial to acceleration or even AP classes. So we don't want to just look at the remediation process. We want to push children and make sure that they're doing their very best. Increase the graduation rate, reduction in the number of suspensions, and hopefully de decreasing the um, behavioral referrals. This is very important. At any point in the RTI process, IDEA 2004 allows parents to request a formal evaluation to determine eligibility for 504 or a special or special education services. I know some schools will say, well, we're only at tier two and we're looking at interventions that will help Wanda, you know, be more successful. But as a parent, you have a right to say that, you know, what you've been doing for the last year isn't working well. So I'm requesting an evaluation. Whenever you do that, make sure that you make that request in writing and always keep your documentation. Okay, the RTI process cannot be used to deny or delay a formal evaluation for special education services. Parent involvement, and I think everyone here knows this is important, you have a say in the decisions the school makes about your child's education. 
only you have an in-depth, long-term uh, daily relationship with your child. You're the permanent member of the team. If your child, for example, has a 504 plan in the third grade and that person or that child is now in the sixth grade, who's the one person who's been the consistent member of that team? The parent. So you have all the information. You are the expert. The teachers may be experts as far as curriculum is concerned, but you're the parent. You know your child better than anyone. When parents are involved, children do better and schools become better. So how um, can I participate effectively as a parent? Understand your rights, prepare for and attend meetings, read your child's school records. At any time, you can uh, send a written request to a school asking to review your child's folders or records. If there's documentation in those records and you're not in agreement with it, you can write to the um, area director or superintendent, associate superintendent, superintendent, saying that you want this document expunged or taken out. Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. But you have that right to review records, just schedule a meeting with the school, they'll have someone to sit with you and you can go through their records. Understand and ask questions put things in writing, and of course keep copies, and then recognize the different roles you and school staff play. For example, in schools, most, most 504 plans are facilitated by the counselor, whereas IEPs fall under the um, special education department. So it's important to know who's responsible for what actions. These are the supports that I will provide you while you and your family are in our care. I'll be able to give you information on home and hospital. And I don't know if some parents know that home and hospital uh, instruction can be intermittent. Sometimes your child may be in and out of school, may need surgery, may not be feeling well. You can make a request for intermittent home and hospital instruction along with home and hospital instruction if your child is in the hospital or at home for a long period of time. Uh, I will also give you information on 504 plans and assist you with the individual educational programs or your IEPs. Connect you with resources needed to make informed educational decisions, help you to resolve concerns, Sometimes I just, I'm just an ear if you want to call and talk with me about, you know, this is what's going on, Wanda. Um, am I on the right track? Do I need to um, uh, get an advocate? Do I need assistance from you? You know, can you call in for an IEP meeting to discuss some of the concerns that we've discussed? I know Dr. Sands has done that, and I don't know Dr. Um, Ms. may have done that as well. So we're here to support you and provide information to increase awareness of community services. Excuse me, I have allergies, as you probably can hear. Resources for family. We have posted um, several documents online for you. Sometimes if you can't talk with us, you can go online. So go to children's homepage, go to the Can Do website, and you can get information and FAQs on home and hospital instruction, how to navigate, how to navigate the 504 and special education processes, uh, when your child has a problem in school, neuropsychological testing versus educational testing, educational websites. Under educational websites, I've given you uh, websites um, on disability awareness and on educational websites. If you have a child that's at home and you want some more support at home as far as reading or math or written language, uh, you can go online and get some of that information and access those websites. Lastly, advocacy resources. Sometimes, unfortunately, the parent and the um, school are not on the same page and you may want to seek advice from an advocate or an attorney. Um, I have information there. I think um, all jurisdictions, Maryland, Virginia, District of Columbia, and West Virginia, so you can access that information as well. Okay. All right, thank you. And I look forward to meeting more of you. I've met a couple of you, and I've even spoken to a couple of you on the telephone. But I'm here to support you. Uh, new roles, so we're working together to um, see how we can best help you.
as you navigate through the school system. Melissa? Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Melissa. I am the program coordinator. I'm a nurse coordinator for the Can Do program. Um, I'm the voice on the other end of the phone and the other end of the emails. We've talked a lot. I've talked to a lot of you, I think. Um, and I want to go over what we do as a program from a bigger picture perspective. Um, so Can Do is, stands for Cardiac and Neurodevelopmental Outcome Program. And our goal is, again, as everybody said, I'll reiterate, we're not looking for trouble, but we're looking to identify and manage developmental problems. Um, you know, as a nurse, you're constantly monitoring for things and making contingency plans, and that's, that's what we're doing with this program, too. We want to be available to um, address any problems that you have and to help you um, cope with, you know, anything that you're going through. So. Um, just to go over who our patients are, we have very loose inclusion criteria. Um, the biggest thing that all the research is geared to is kids who had heart surgery in their first year of life. Obviously, those patients are part of our program. We also take care of kids who have a cyanotic heart defect or if they were quote unquote born blue. Um, the other patients that we see are patients who have a heart defect. They may not have required surgery, but they also have a neurologic risk factor. Um, and the last kind of blanket inclusion criteria is if your child has any type of heart issue, like I said, you don't have to require surgery. It can be something like an arrhythmia. And if your pediatrician or you or your cardiologist has a concern about their development, let us know. We can help. Okay. Um, and as our program has grown, we've kind of developed into an inpatient and an outpatient perspective. Um, Dr. D'Onofrio showed you our big map, and I'm just going to break it down for you to talk about the things that we do. Um, so while patients are in the hospital, we do developmental rounds. Um, it occurs on a weekly basis, and we meet in the ICU with providers, therapists, um, our child development psychologists, pharmacists social workers, child life, and we talk about a couple patients in particular who might be struggling from a developmental perspective or might be at a very high risk because they've been in the hospital for a while. And we look to optimize what we can do while patients are in the hospital to promote their development. We also look from a bigger perspective at the list of patients who are in the hospital and see who qualifies for services that they might not be receiving. For example, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, an extra visit or two from the child life team or the volunteer team. So we use that as an opportunity to kind of extend our program to promote development to all the patients in the CICO. We also see kids on the step-down unit. Dr. Mintz and I um, stop by and see all the kids who qualify for our program or who p have been referred to us. And we meet with them just to introduce ourselves and to address any developmental concerns as well as to establish a follow-up plan um, once patients go home. At this point, we give out our individualized educational or individualized um, developmental plans that Dr. D'Onofrio had mentioned and she had showed you parts of it. So we give those out in the HKU as well so that parents have something to go home with to kind of go over stuff we say. Because we know that when you're in the hospital, there's a lot of things going on and you might not remember every interaction you have with people. So it's nice to go home with something tangible. And then all of our patients get a neurology evaluation. This usually occurs when they're in the ICU, um, but it can happen on the floor as well. But you know, all of our patients touch base with neurology inpatient and we connect them with services outpatient as well. And then this is our, our outpatient roadmap. Um, as Dr. Sands had mentioned, we see kids so frequently when they're little, every six months. Um, that seems like a lot, but as we mentioned before, you know, a six-month-old is very different than a 12-month-old, et cetera. Um, and as kids get older, we see them at, at specific intervals, so right before kindergarten, right before middle school, and right before high school. I just want to clarify that this is kind of like the basic check-in model that we would like to see everybody in. Um, obviously, if you have concerns and you're not, quote, unquote, due to come see us, you can still come see us. Um, I think about this like, you know, when you go see your pediatrician, there are regular intervals that you go see them, but there are also other times that you're checking in. Um, 
So some of the other things our program is working on, we opened a multidisciplinary clinic in October, and it has been an absolute blast to be a part of, and I think it has been really great for our patients as well. We've gotten some really great feedback. Um, our clinic is geared toward kids under three at the moment. We're working on expanding a multidisciplinary model to take care of our older kids as well, but that gets slightly more complicated because those visits are longer and you can't see, you know, four 12-year-olds in one day when the visits are, are multiple hours. Um, so this clinic, we see kids under three. We combine nutrition, speech, child development, and neurology. And what we're looking for is to combine some of these visits. So when your child is six to nine months old and you're supposed to come in for a child development evaluation and a neurology evaluation, we know that can be a lot especially with other medical visits that you have going on. So we wanted to combine that into one visit to alleviate some stress for families. Um, and of course, from a collaboration perspective, it's really nice to meet with different members of the team to have everybody weighing in on, you know, what's the best path for this patient, what's the best follow-up plan. Um, this isn't the only way we see patients for can do, but this is just a new model that we're trying. Um, and, you know, given, the resources and things that go into having clinic space, we're, we're working on expanding it, but right now we're seeing about four patients every week um, for kids under three. So we'll keep you posted on how it's growing and other opportunities for older kids to be seen as well. Um, and how do you get in touch with me with the Can Do program? You can get in touch with me. Um, you can ask your pediatrician to get in touch with me. You can ask your cardiologist. Um, the big thing we want you to do is to not worry that if your child, if your child has behavioral concerns or school concerns or any concerns at all, you can get in touch with us, but you don't need those things to get in touch with us. Your child can be doing wonderfully and great and you have no concerns. Just keep in touch so that we can make sure that progress continues to go that way. Um, Kids at any age can enter the program. You don't have to have had surgery at Children's. You don't have to be followed by cardiology at Children's. A couple of the patients we saw in our Friday clinic this week had outside cardiologists. Um, so if you have any questions at all, just let me know. I'm happy to go over, um, you know, how we can best serve your family through Can Do. Um, some advice for, for parents. Um, I am not a parent, so I, I got this from other, other parents. But talk to your cardiologist about neurodevelopment. Um, if you have concerns, if you don't have concerns, open that conversation, open that door, and then, you know, we can help you as well. Um, and then talk to your providers, your pediatricians, about resources in your area. We want to make this a sustainable program and a sustainable way to help families, and maybe that's not always coming back to children for every single solitary service, and we know that people are from all over the place and they come here. So we want to make sure that you have local resources in your community to be able to support you. Um, our program is really lucky in that we have a lot of nationwide collaboration. So a lot of our team is involved in something called CNOC. It stands for Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Outcome Collaborative. And it's a nationwide organization and it's established to promote um, and implement best practices to promote neurodevelopment for kids with a cardiac history. So Dr. Sands is a co-chair um, of this organization. Dr. Wernowski, who's an ICU attending, um, he's a chair of the Program and Meetings Committee. Dr. D'Onofrio is part of it. I'm part of the quality improvement aspect of it. Um, and Children's National, Dr. Sands could probably talk a little bit more about this than I can, but um, Children's National just became home to the Neurodevelopmental Core Lab, and Dr. Sands is our um, PI, or principal investigator. So we're definitely at the forefront for being able to implement the best practices that are going on nationwide right here. Um, this is just a visual for other members who were part of the CNOC group, and it's also a visual to families who, you know, might be transient in the area, might be watching and, you know, live in Washington, D.C. There are other centers across the country that provide neurodevelopmental care. So we want you to be empowered to, again, talk to your cardiologist, know that you can seek out these programs and get the support that you need. Um, this is a picture of our lovely team. Um, just to give you some perspective, it involves a nurse practitioner, a child life specialist, a social worker, an education specialist, neurology, child development, nutrition, cardiology, nursing, um, and neuropsychology. So 
lot, a lot of really awesome people working together and a lot of great perspectives that, you know, ultimately come together for the best outcomes for the patient. And I know you see some familiar faces in that as well. Um, so I just have a last slide with our contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Um, I think a lot of our cards are out on the table outside, um, but, you know, whatever we can do to help in terms of providing you um, some education, connecting you to services, just talking about what the next step would be, we're here. And that's just a little snippet from our website. If you want to, you know, learn a little bit more or if some of the stuff we said didn't sink in, the website will kind of reiterate a lot of what we talked about today. So. Thank you.